So welcome everyone to the first international AGN seminar series for the semester. So thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we hope everybody is well and um, that you got some rest this summer. And for those who are, who are new, um, this seminar series started during the peak of the pandemic and it was organized by myself and Gabby Canaliso um, at UC Riverside. And we wanted to just bring together the AGN uh, Galaxy co-evolution enthusiasts all over the globe um, to have some inspiring talks and some stimulating discussion and possibly to forge new collaborations uh, between people uh, across the world. And we did that. So um, this semester we've joined forces uh, with Misty Benz. Uh, Aaron Hicks, Vivian Yu, and Janelle Walsh, all of whom gave excellent and really inspiring talks uh, last year, so I encourage you to take a look at them. Um, so they are co-organizing and co-hosting the series this year. And just uh, for those who don't know, the talks are 40 minutes, and they're followed by a discussion, um, and then it's followed by a student-led session where the speakers can talk to the next generation of scientists and inspire them and give them advice. And all of the talks um, are recorded and they're posted on the website um, that you can access uh, in the email and also on a YouTube channel. So we encourage you to subscribe to that. Maybe so I should stop. sorry, maybe I should stop sorry. <laughs> oh no, no. <laughs> so um, this semester, in response to the feedback from you, um, the seminar is going to take place twice a month, um, according to the schedule that's posted on the website. And uh, it's going to include a range of talks that were requested from the feedback that we sent. Um, so topics ranging from dust in AGM, which you're going to hear all about today, um, radio obs observation and AGNs, AGN feedback, and of course, all of the exciting early JWST results, which um, every day we're hearing more and more about. Um, and in addition, we plan to host some work workshops on the most requested topics um, based on the survey that we sent. And um, so there'll be more about that. And just so you know that one of the highly requested topics was burnout, sadly. So in response to that, we plan to have uh, monthly lunches, just informal lunches uh, for faculty and research scientists and a separate one for um, students just to talk about things like burnout, um, the state of the field or the world. Um, and just general topics of interest, uh, just informally. So that information is on the website, which you can access um, from the email. So um, with that, I wanted to introduce today's speaker. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Almudena Prieto. Um, Almudena is a senior astronomer at the Instituto Astrofisica de Canarias in Spain. And uh, she is an associate scientist at the University Observatory of Munich, Germany. So Almudena got her PhD in physics um, at University Complutense Madrid. Um, she is the lead of the Parsec project, which is a multi-wavelength in investigation of the central parsecs of galaxies across the electromagnetic spectrum. She's um, the European PI of the FRIDA instrument, which is an adaptive optics IFU on the 10 meter um, Gran Telescopia de Canarias in Canaries, Spain. And previously she was the lead scientist for the end of life calibration of the cameras on board the Rosat X-ray Observatory. And uh, she's, was also the lead scientist uh, for the European Southern Observatory um, definition and implementation of the service mode of the VLT. And she really is an expert in multi-wavelength studies of the central parsecs of AGNs, 
um, having published widely on black hole accretion, nuclear star formation, and adaptive optics instrumentation. Um, she's really published extensively using ground-based and space-based observatories across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you um, Dana today. Um, so the floor is yours, Dana. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Sovita. And let's share. You, you hear now, you, you, sorry, you, you see now the screen. Okay, yeah. So thank you, thank you for having me here and thank you for you all for being there. Um, yeah, so it asked me to talk about um, dust in the center part of several galaxies. And that this is a, a, a subject I study quite a lot. And of course, within the framework of the Parsec project, uh, so it indicates uh, briefly what it is. The Parsec project uh, is a study across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, the central Parsec near galaxies. Near galaxies, regardless of activity, very active or, or no active uh, at all, whatever is bright, and particularly we could do it uh, in the infrared with adaptive optics because it was um, one, it's one of the conditions that we can get uh, high angular resolution maps in the infrared. Um, we were we were doing it. And uh, we cover a wide range of instrumentation that uh, provide us with high angular resolution across the, the spectrum. And uh, it's not per se the idea or the goal to get high angular resolution no matter what, it's more the idea of get a given physical scale uh, the same and different range of electromagnetic spectrum. So when we study a process or different processes in a physical region, a given physical region, we study the same process in other range of electromagnetic spectrum. So we don't we don't mix. That is the the main goal. Whatever when we achieve it, we try it, but is to have same physical scale, the smaller possible, of course, across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the central parts of galaxies you, or central region of galaxies are past the scale because we study more than the parcel region, usually is central few hundred passes to kiloparsec, um, include plenty of phenomena, um, starting by the, the, the activity of the, of the center, different levels. A yet secretion of flows and flows and star formation. We try to tackle the different aspects because at parts of the scale is very interesting to, to join physics in different range of electromagnetic spectrum. And the presence of, of dust uh, and the, the structure of this dust in the center has been one of the major uh, activities we, we have done. And uh, what I wanted to uh, to get into the talk is this transparency, which is the conclusion. So it's always nice to start by the conclusion, so you know how long will it take, more or less. <laughs> um, I will show it to you that um, dust and dust filaments and lens, because we can resolve the, the structure of the dust in our high resolution maps, is ubiquitous. We see in, in center of galaxies, all the time, most of the times, all the galaxies we have studied, of course, near universe. Um, regardless of activity, we see it. And these filaments usually uh, they arise at kilopasses distances or, or hundred passes distances. Sometimes are very small regions, sometimes it's few passes, but most of the times or in a kilopasses distances. And when they get centered, because we can follow them, they are very coherent collimated structures. They cross the AN and they might, might cross it or not. They can pass close to it and they can obscure it, they might obscure it. And therefore, the role of these filaments, as I will present, is more than a role, is, is I would say, is a fact that you, you will be able to judge by yourself, is that they can naturally 
produce this dichotomy that we have in AES between type one and type two. And you will see, I will put the samples you can judge by yourself. And because we follow them from large distances, um, and for the type, because of the type of morphology they have, and sometimes the kinematics, when we are able to, to tackle it, to, to use it, not always is possible. Um, is we think, oh, I, I think that these are channels like motorways through which material flows are streamers that carry material, material from the outer part in the galaxy, sometimes even from the outside the galaxy to the very central region, to feed the star formation when there is there, and to feed the black hole, to feed the hole. That's what I will try to convey in the end. So because um, I'm talking about filaments and whether they pass by the center or, or get close to the center, um, the way we do is by constructing dust maps, which are very simple the way we do. Uh, we simply compare an optical image with an infrared image, and we do the ratio. And um, we need to have both images equivalent angular resolution, because otherwise we create artifacts. So that is why we resort in the infrared to have adaptive optics, because uh, with a big telescopes and adaptive optics, like what we have here, the sample I do with 1068, we get comparable angular resolutions as we get in the space telescope in the visual, about. And we need this resolution, and we need also a very accurate registration, because we are, uh, you will see, I'm going to see structures, very filamentary, and I need to know very well precisely where these filaments fall, if it's in the nucleus, or around, or across, across it, whatever. So that is what we do. I want to introduce this very briefly. For example, with 1068, we take an optical image, as you see here, and an infrared image, adaptive optic image. You may already see that the optical image is very much confused or confused, deformed by one by dust fingers of dust in all directions. And the infrared is always, most of the time, is very smooth, it's not affected by dust. So at the minute that you do a ratio of these two images, you will enhance um, those regions that are depressed by dust in the optical, but they are the, the normal emission in the galaxy. To do this, we have to do a good registration, and we never use the nucleus for the registration of the image or coordinates. We use point line sources that are in the field. For example, here there are plenty. These are usually globular clusters. So or start forming real, but most of the time in most galaxies are globalized clusters. And we take several of them across the field of view and we register optical infrared with these point light sources. But we never use the nucleus because obviously the nucleus could be absorbed. So unless we have nothing else, we never use the nucleus for registration. So you do this ratio, as I say, in 1068, you get this dust map. It's about, we have two kilopascals region around in this, uh, in this dust map, in this galaxy. And you have the bright regions reflect the, the regions where we have mostly that, particular in the center. You have, you might see a bit of kind of green structure or bracelet, and then the nucleus is at the very center. Let's make, assume the central few hundred passes that you see better. And you have the nucleus here, a kind of, a horn of bracelet around the nucleus with two horns on top. Oh, sorry. Ah, sorry, sorry. Um, around the nucleus, you have regions that are not having dust, like this big hole around, and others that you have dust and um, different optical thickness. The brightness of this image tells you a bit how thick is the dust. And if I translate this dust map in, in extinction, is the, the, the figure that you have on the right. And you see that around the central region is where we get higher extinctions, about eight magnitudes, is where the nucleus is. Uh, the bracelet, the, the, this bracelet is around, it's a bit lower extinction slide, and then lower and lower around in regions where we don't have uh, dust at all. The extinction is basically zero because there is no, no dust. And eight magnitudes here in this nucleus is more than enough 
to secure this nucleus in the act to the UV. Uh, you don't need anything else. It's more than enough. You can do it with low where you want for the luminosity of the source. Okay. So I will go now that this is the procedure, and I will go you uh, go now with a couple of some samples of type two nuclei and type one nuclei. You see where how these structures appear. So for type two nuclei, I take to more normal galaxies or less uh, famous ones. I took this um, galaxy on the top. It's a low luminosity AGN type two. The skewer is completely. Uh, the nucleus completely obscure on the top. And below, I take a, a normal activity, uh, Cipher to galaxy, the galaxy as well. Uh, contrary to the case of 1068, you will see the, the optical images in color, the space telescope images in color in both. In contours is the K-band image, the adaptive optics. And you see that the optical image looks very uniform in both cases. And you, you will wonder, there is no much test because the optical and the, in the contours follow very nicely each other. Now, if we do a, 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 a dust map, a ratio of the optical and the infrared, you get, starting by the middle panel, no dust in the surroundings, but you get dust in the center, always. And it's very much a structure. In the upper part, you have this kind of filament. I will emphasize, I will enhance or zoom uh, in the right panel. You see this filament getting towards the center. The contours are always the K band. The center is marked by the, by the point like source that we see normally always in the K band, the nucleus we always recover in the K band in most cases. And you have these filaments that spiral to the center, okay? Um, we have this other case where there is basically no dust, but at the very center, there is a kind of, I would say a disc, perhaps H on, that cross a little bit the nucleus. We see still the nucleus, okay? It's a partial obscure nucleus, okay? This is central kilo passes, here is the few hundred passes. So in this case, the, the filament is very small, it's about 30 passes in length, here we get over several hundred passes with this filament spiral towards the center. And if I'm translating a stintium map, uh, is what you have, this spiral, uh, uh, nuclear spiral again, more emphasized, we get up to um, and the three magnitudes towards the center, which is sufficient to secure as well this nucleus because it's very weak, it's 10 to the 42. So it's, it's more than enough to secure the nucleus in this galaxy that we get to the very center. For this other galaxy, higher activity is more luminous, we get a little bit, we get 1.5 magnitudes at the center, but this galaxy we see partially the nucleus. And indeed, this is a type 1.9 is classified um, um, in the literature. So it's not fully obscured, it's partially obscured. Okay. This is for type two examples of, of cases. And if I go to a type one nuclei, it's about a bit the same. I choose two examples, a very bright type one in the first uh, in the panels above uh, with a luminosity of 10 to the 44. And below, I take a counterpart, very low luminosity, uh, it's the Sombrero Galaxy. Both are type one. We see the nucleus in all of them at the UV. So we make again the ratio, the optic, the infrared to the optical. You get the, the dust maps here in the middle. You might already see a bit the filament here, something bright here. You see something bright here on the uh, plane of Sombrero. And this central kilopascal region, we get a zoom of the central hundred passes. And then we see again the filament with the spiral towards the center. And we saw in the former case with a, a type two source, a low luminosity in that case. You remember the spiral, nuclear spiral, we see a little bit here. And in sombrero is more uh, um, distributed in a plane. There are different filaments, they cross. The, the center, the nucleus is not really crossed by a filament. It's getting close. The, the big, thicker filaments are not even passing by the nucleus. And if I translate in uh, stintium maps, 
Then you have these filaments, uh, the stitching is about maximum 1.5 magnitude, with it will do nothing for a source that is 10 to the 44. That's very bright. But uh, sombrero is two orders of magnitude less. It can make it uh, some uh, extension, but what happened is that the extension is very mild. It's barely one magnitude, and the, we see the nucleus very well in the extension uh, map because the filaments yeah, are thicker around the nucleus, but not at the nucleus itself. This is not the, by the way, this is not the, the, um, the big dust lane of sombrero. Uh, the sombrero nucleus is above the dust lane. The dust lane of sombrero is here, this is structured down. Uh, sombrero galaxy, the nucleus is a little bit above. So this is another plane of dust crossing the nucleus of oh, sombrero. Okay, so that is about the filament. You see they can cross type one, type two, uh, and they are, whether they are low luminosity or high luminosity, high activity or no mass activity, like sombrero, we have them there. Okay, the, that was one of the roles of the, of the torus to make a distinction between one type one and type two. Uh, the end inclination. Um, one of the roles of the torus, fundamental one, sometimes it's forgotten about, is the collimation of the nuclear extended ionized gas. Um, we see that quite often in active uh, nuclei. Um, in, many, in some cases, we see beautiful bite cones. And so how we do with these filaments? And I want to show you that at least from the point of view of the doors, or whether it does or not, I think there is not such a collimation at all. Because these filaments produce the collimation and you will you can judge for yourself. Here I show you another sample of dust maps, other galaxies we are looking at that you get a bit entertained with different types. This is two type two galaxies in the dust maps, the contours are um, in white, the K band, infrared, um, on top of the ratio between the infrared to optical, it's always the dust map is always done that way. And these are type two, we're in the borderline between active source, standard accretion, and almost low accretion, uh, standard accretion, uh, ratio, sorry, and low editing. A little bit we're close to low luminosity, but at the borderline. Tirfinus is a type two source, bright, and uh, Cipher two galaxy is a prototype, and Sombrero is a type one, okay? And you have in this galaxy, I like it very much because you see one of these filaments crossing entirely the nucleus. And here you have uh, the more than filaments dust lanes that cross the nucleus, but the thicker dust lane is not just at the nucleus. They, I, remember, I remind you that the, the peak of the in the contours the, the is in the K band, it point to the position of the nucleus. Okay, so the thicker filament is a little bit below the nucleus, thirthinos. Okay, and below I can to show you also how the extinction maps are to get an idea of how thick are these filaments. So in this case, we have about four magnitudes across the nucleus, so sufficient to hide this nucleus in the, in the optical end UV. And here in this case, is the nucleus is here. The thicker filament is four and a half magnitudes. Here is a little bit less, but it's still sufficient to hide uh, about three magnitudes or so to hide the nucleus. You saw the case of sombrero type one. We see uh, the nucleus anyway, because the extension is very mild. And if I put now for all these uh, dust maps, the uh, where the ionized gas goes is this. So the dust map I repeated here below, and in green I put the ionized gas from the space telescope, high angle resolution. And you see, for example, here is very nice. You have the filament, and the ionized gas is cut sharp by the filament. Okay, you you don't see on the right side of the filament. You see on the left side because there is no mass dust here. And even regions when there is no mass dust are filled with ionized gas. Okay. Most of the ionized gas is on the left because most of the dust 
as you see in the desk map, is on the right. In this case, we have a white cone or ionized gas which is settled in this thick filament, not on the nucleus, in the thick filament. The, and it disappeared because most of the dust is below this thick filament. And then the green contours appear again with the dust. It's very thin, okay? Thirthinus is beautiful. It's one of the prototypes of bicone. It's only one side, what we see is this one. And it's perfectly sharp cut by these two filaments that get almost in right angle, okay? And in sombrero, there are also ionized gut, but it covers overlap with the with the dust filaments. Why? Because as we saw it was the, the, the distinction of the, the optical thickness of these filaments are very low. So it does nothing to each other. They, they can they can be together, they can overlap together especially. So, so uh, I think that the ionized gut morphologies that we see very often and uh, optical active nuclei of different levels of activity, ionizing cone is strictly defined by the presence of these dust filaments. Okay, there is a very clear anticorrelation, spatial anticorrelation. You see the dust, of course, depends on the optical of the dust. If it's very low, you see dust and ionized gas all together. But if it's not the case, and depending on whether these filaments are more thick or not, you will see ionized gas or not. Okay, so that is what about the ionized gas. Now, I would like to talk a bit about where these filaments arise, where the origin, where is the origin? Um, you have already seen a little bit uh, that I can trace them sometimes from kilo passes, in general from the center of few hundred passes. And I want to show you this case is, uh, is um, of course it's one of the best, that's why I'm going to, sh to show it to you. Um, where we can trace the filaments from almost the edge the, of the disk of the galaxy all the way to the central passes. This is a low luminosity again, very well known, 1097. This is an optical image. Um, the nucleus, the black hole is at the center. It has a circumnuclear star forming ring, which is very well known. It's extensively studied because it's very rich. And you have the disk of the galaxy and these two dust lanes, one from the north, one from the south, actually it's a bar. And already from the optical image, you might see it's quite a structure, uh, filamentary with this dust lane. A little bit zooming, you see a little bit better how the dust lane gets in the ring, on top of the ring. And this is a very sharp image where we combine Optical infrared at the optics and uh, space telescope. You see again the dust lane coming here, circular, oh, sorry, circularizing along the ring. Okay. And plenty of filaments of dust, fingers of dust that cross the, the ring in all directions. Some of these filaments that get of the dust lane that get here, some of them get along the ring, but some of them circularize towards the center. You see plenty of fingers here. So we get now a very sharp image, AO, uh, one micron at the center. I take away the, the light of the galaxy and this filament I was showing to you before, this is the dust lane coming from a far away, thank you, see, so 10 kilo passes away. It's a split it already, you might see a bit, and it gets in and then spiral to the center the nucleus, the black hole is at the center. Another spiral, uh, nuclear spiral arm get here, close here, you might see from, from outside, another one here, another one here. I mean, in different directions, we can cross uh, towards the center uh, to see this nuclear spiral getting circularizing towards the center. That is why I'm saying that these are channels to transport material, in this case, from kilo passes distance. Remember, I come from the uh, the outer part of the galaxy of the disk directly towards the central region. The angular resolution here is about 10 passes or so. Okay, so um, we can make a, a cut 
of the to see a little bit of the structure of these filaments here for example we have uh, we make uh, this that uh, this line we make a cut like that and we see how the structure is and you see how we get all these peaks these are the filaments that are we cut it here we we are able to to separate it, uh, them and even measure upper limits the width of these filaments and because we measure how many we have, we have an idea of the filling factor, the filaments, filaments in the dust lane. So how much mass get in them? And also very interesting, very important from the dust maps is that um, these are uh, extinction maps. So we measure colon densities through the, the, the galaxy. Therefore, we measure um average in column density we measure all the material is true we don't know exactly what it is but we measure all the material that is obscuring producing whatever is producing this obscuration so it's a very deep column density through the galaxy and from that because we have volumes uh, uh, morphology we can infer the density of these filaments okay which is in this order so filling factor densities volumes we can get an idea of how much mass goes in them of course the mm, interesting enough to see what eventually we would like to know is how much is inflow rate how much mass is moving through these filaments eventually towards the center ring and for that with this is not enough of course we need a tracer of we need velocities we need kinematics and we had to resort to molecular gas to, to see whether in, in certain uh, lines in molecular gas we can trace these filaments and assuming the velocity of the molecular gas is the same, uh, we can get um, uh, inflow rates okay, when it's inflow. Okay. So again, I know I said what some of them you I already showed to you, dust maps uh, from this for example, this type 1AN, 1566. Um, again, the, the, here, the obscure uh, areas are where the obscuration is happening. 1097, I saw it to you before, a bit zooming in the center, the spiral, nuclear spiral, 1068 as well. And how do we see that in molecular gas? Well, it turned out that when we have the uh, ALMA molecular maps a sufficient angular resolution and we tend to see a good match between this absorption this obscuration um this traces of obscuration whatever it is and the molecular gas so for example in in this galaxy in blue is the molecular gas measured in co32 okay not all the regions in the mole in the dust are sampled but nicely enough towards the center, we sample well the uh, dust map, the structure, the scuration with the molecular gas and define kind of, so kind of spiral as well, nuclear spiral. Uh, in 1097 as well, here is in contours. This is from Isumi, also in 3.2. Um, as you see again, not all the filaments are trace, but at least at the center region, this type of S structure here is following three in, the, in this line, in 3.2. And um, in 1068, in many different uh, lines is trace, depending on the angular solution, it's well traced. I choose the molecular warm uh, uh, H2 uh, in uh, two microns because it has very high angular resolution. And well, it's a little bit complex, but at least you might see that in H2, if this bracelet, this big ring is followed nicely, where there is no dust, there is nothing, no molecular gas here in H2, and in other traces I haven't seen either. Most of it is in the east side of the galaxy. And you, you see a little bit this kind of hole that was all the time referring to and closing the nucleus. Well, I don't know if you are able to see, but there is a kind of tongue in H2 that gets exactly in between these two uh, uh, arms of the, of the hole that gets up towards the center. Okay. 
And so different authors have, uh, are measured the kinematic of this gas in these particular uh, cases where I could trace from the literature and derive the, the, what the gas is doing. And usually you have a circular motion that you have to subtract, this is very common. And then from the residual, you start to see whether you have a real motion and this is motion is com commensurate, is compatible with inflow. And in this case happened to be, um, uh, Alice is concluded by this outdoors that is inflow, matter that is flowing along this uh, um, uh, molecular uh, gas, molecular tracer. And um, if we have uh, now the velocities from these maps, different lines, and we have the dust maps, from the dust maps we have, uh, as I said before, the morphology, the volume, the density. From the molecular maps, if they trace well, much well, we can infer the velocities. We need to have an idea of inclination. This is a, a matter of concern as well. Uh, but assuming you can more or less infer inclination or, or use the inclination of the galaxy, you can derive inflow mass rates towards the center. Inflows, no accretion, inflow. We cannot tackle accretion. And so for 1068, these authors infer that you have uh, with NH2 the range of 50 solar masses per year, they can trace up to 10 parsecs. And then, then 1097 has been measured at different distances. What usually happens is that uh, along a longer distances, you, your inflow rate is higher. And as you approach the center, the inflow rate you infer are lower and lower. So the closest we can get is about 0.2 solar masses per year at 40 parsecs. That's the, uh, the closest we can get, depending on the resolution. And in 1566, uh, we get about the same uh, 0.2 solar masses per year at 50 passes. So we are in range of 50 passes or less and um, um, inflow rates, well, okay, from a few solar masses to practically 10 for solar masses in general. Um, we did, we there to go as well with Andromeda. Uh, Andromeda also has filaments. It's a very, very low uh, eddington source, very quiescent. And in this case, we use uh, aero simulations to try to get a, a, an idea of the inflow rate. And uh, we dare to do that because we have, uh, uh, it's so close that we can get plenty of information from, from the galaxy, from the central region that serves as an input for the hydro simulations. So um, we did that from Spitzer images, even though Spitzer does not have angular resolution, nothing of what I said now here can be used for the galaxies I, I told you before. Andromeda, yes, because it's very close. So this is a 24 micron image uh, of Spitzer, uh, Spitzer or Andromeda. The nucleus is here, and these are the spiral arms of Andromeda. It's a section of it. Uh, seen in dust because it's 24 microns, dust heated by the plenty of star forming regions that are in the spiral arms. Uh, you might see already from one of these spiral arms, like a plume that gets circularized towards the center. Here it is a sum of this region, this, the, this uh, circunuclear ring that gets to form towards the center, it's the plume that gets there. This we get now to eight microns because that is where we have higher contrast of the filaments. And you can judge by yourself. Here is simply dust in emission, no in associations as I showed you before in previous cases in emission. And you see all this structure, this tiny, um, narrow, tiny, narrow, um, very fine structures that tend to circularize towards the center. The black hole is here and many more uh, filaments that get towards directly towards the nuclear. So we run in this case hydro simulation. We injected gas a certain distance from the from the from the the, the ring to form a kind of circunuclear star forming ring, like in the case I saw you before in 1087. So we injected gas uh, um, and let it 
moved down under the potential of the galaxy. We knew the potential of the galaxy, the potential of the black hole, etc. So we jet cast a certain distance along the, the star forming ring, like in 1097, we see it, these filaments arriving. And we let it evolve the system over the million years. So here are different snapshots of this. Uh, simulations we do. I don't. Uh, it's, I don't pretend that you are going to 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 get this. I, I'm not going to speak that. It's just simply to show you what we are doing. And we let the ball. We run many of them until we get a configuration that is resemble a little what we see. And this was one of those that we get this kind of configuration, a kind of ring. And in all cases. We see this type of, I, I hope you are able to see kind of very thin structure. These are filaments that tend to spiral towards the center, always. And here in the configuration, we choose the final one. Um, after a number of several million years, we get these filaments getting from the ring and circularizing towards the center. The center is formed a disk. We are not able to see this disk in the in this map. We see the disk in uh, in velocity in molecular gas, no in the in the in the filaments as we see here because of resolution. And from this, uh, we end up with um, inflow rate. If we could get it up to six passes, we didn't want to get any farther in, or oh, about. Very little, 10 to minus 7 solar mass per year, which is consistent with the fact that Andromeda is very, very quiet. Okay. We, we didn't control this number. We simply put a number of particles, a certain distance, one kilo pass, and we let it flow. Okay. We let it flow, move up. We include all the physics for cooling, shock, thermal expansion, etc. And systematically we get in this kind of spiral, nuclear spiral. And uh, at the end, a certain distance, because we don't include accretion, uh, we measure the uh, the inflow rate and we took this process and we get this, this number, okay? Which is consistent with the low activity of the source. So putting all together, there are not many of these nuclei that could be infer this inflow rates because you need this combination of good high resolution maps and in a tracer in molecular gas and or and you need the um, morphology of the of the of the structure of the filaments uh, you need volumes etc this we can get from the dust map so you know always is uh, this combination of things are available, but for the cases I could gather from the literature we made, um, here is a list of, of sources, and there are a couple of two more, and I ordered them from activity or Eddington ratio, so 1068 is the more uh, higher into source, and is the one we measure higher inflow rate, usually at a similar distance, 30 parsecs. And there is a hint. I'm not going to say that this, this is a conclusion because there is no statistic, but it seems to be a hint that as we go in Eddington ratio, uh, lower activity, low in Eddington ratio, um, and that's why I want to show Andromeda, the inflow rates tend to go slower and lower. Of course, this does not mean that it's an indication of accretion because accretion is a farther step, far more complicated, and we had to lose angular momentum. So does not tell as much the inflow rate about what happened next uh, at the accretion level. But at least we know that if the source is tend to be low active, uh, presumably we are going to measure very rather low inflow rate in line with the activity of the no activity of the source. Okay, so I wanted to finish with um, a comparison of the filaments with our Milky Way, because there is nothing special of, of, about them. Uh, I mean, they are there in all the galaxies you see continuously, or I think I tried to convince you that is quite common, this, uh, this type of morphology um, in the center. 
And uh, the Milky Way is full of filament. This interstellar medium is very rich, and we see equally long and collimated filaments, very coherent structure over kilopascal distance, which is quite amazing. We don't understand well how this is uh, maintained. Uh, but I wanted to show you the center of the Milky Way, Sagittarius say. And this is an image in the far infrared. Uh, Sagittarius say is here. This is the central hundred passes the Milky Way, taking from this southward Molinari. And uh, what well, you see all the filaments here around and following a kind of coherent structure. Um, this is, at, contrary to what I show you up to now, this is dust in emission. What I show you to now in all these galaxies, is that in Andromeda, uh, is only the tracer or something that is producing absorption of the light. And I could match it somewhat with molecular gas. Here, we see what produced the discoloration directly. This is the dust, this is dust emitting far infrared. Of course, with this is Herschel, does not have resolution, but the Milky Way is just next to us. So we can, or these people can resolve and see this structure very nice. And I like to compare with this galaxy that I saw to you before, 1386, and this is type two nucleus obscured by this filament that grows by it, it's for magnitude. And I like to compare because, oh, sorry, because this type of morphology that if you see, you, he, you see here particular morphology like an ellipse or uh, yeah, elliptical shape, while well, happen accidentally that you, we see as well in the center of the galaxy. And I, I don't want to make any case about that. I, this is only to point it to you that a global scale, the central hundred percent of this and, uh, and our Milky Way looks similar as regard long scale structure of this filament. So you see this filament here, and you see also this filament here. Okay, nothing else. The filaments can go in any direction as they want. Um, the uh, this is in the far infrared. Um, the in Andromeda. Uh, what I show you was the mid infrared at eight microns. Eight microns where we see better these filaments. And again, um, this is dust in emission. It's not like here or in the old galaxies I showed to you, which is simply the traces or something that absorbs the light. Here I see directly what is absorbing the light, what is producing. So mechanism emitting, dust emitting at eight microns. I can do that in Andromeda because it's very close and I can use a spitzer. But obviously, as far as you go beyond Andromeda, you don't have resolution to produce these maps in any of the galaxies. So here I want to, to say that, well, we have a, an opportunity with GMWST, of course. And um, I wanted with a sample of Andromeda to, to show you how these filaments show up now in the in the infrared. Um, this is a collection of images, spicer images of Andromeda central kilopascals from 3.6 microns until 8 microns. Of course, in the infrared, you are not affected by dust. So the image is very smooth, four microns as well, start to get less bright in five microns and eight microns you get a bit uh, pushy because the light of the stellar light goes down. And so we start to see what is behind the dust, but emitting, okay? If I look in the optical, as I saw you before in all the maps with uh, dust maps, this is a uh, almost uh, optical stream or V uh, image, you see a little bit, I hope you see the, the fingers of obscuration, but that's it, not much at the center. You had to remove the light of the galaxy to see the filaments. The obscuration, this is the obscuration. But if I do here, with the same, remove the stellar light, I see the same filament, but now directly where they are in emission, the dust, okay? So I hope that we can, uh, um, with my colleagues, uh, with the Yemdrusti, we are uh, one of the projects we can do is try to uh, 
uh, unmask this uh, filaments on the real nature if they are there and study the properties the, the nature and even able to tackle uh, in this case directly accretion so i'm finishing and just getting to the conclusions um, i will summarize now um, i try to show you that we have in center of galaxies near universe large scale dust filaments coherent structure we can trace from kilopasses distance at least from several hundred passes as well depending on how deep are our image and uh, these filaments can cross the center of type one and type two alike we see regardless of activity or regardless of classification they are there okay yes that depending on the optical thickness of the filament and also of the nuclear luminosity of the source, these filaments can fully obscure the nucleus or partially obscure it or no obscure at all. Okay. Um, the collimation of the, of the ionized gas, I think is definitely described very sharply by, uh, it's quite obvious to me at least, that is produced by these filaments. Um, and you don't need actually the wall collimation is not even applicable. The, the, the ionized gas gets there and show up where there is no dust. That's it. If there is no dust or it's not sufficiently thick to obscure it, the ionized gas, the optical ionized, optical ionized, say H alpha or three or lower, shorter wavelengths. And the, the, last, the last thing, a uh, uh, few cases we could infer kind of inflow rate towards the center. I think these filaments, the major role are streamers uh, to carry material from several hundred passes, perhaps kilo passes, I don't know, perhaps from the outer part of the galaxy, all the way towards the central region to feed the hole, to feed the star formation as well when there is the we see both. And I hope that this uh, filament that so far what I show you is only in absorption, we can really unveil in, in emission in the real, uh, in what they are per se, in dust, in emission with uh, gender WST in combination with, with that. And that's it. That's all. Great, thank you so much, Amudena. So let's give Amudena a hand for a wonderful talk. Um, thank you. Very inspiring images. Um, so, uh, questions? So I have questions. If, no, oh, Anil has a question. I actually had a question kind of about M31. Um, so I'm wondering about, you know, you, if you, I guess first, I kind of a two-part question. First, if you go out to the same scales that you're measuring other galaxies on, can you get a measurement for the kind of a similar comparable measurement to the gas inflow rate at the kind of 50 parsec scales? Um, and I guess my other question is why, uh, which is like, why is M31 so much lower accretion rate than everything else if you know, there's plenty of dust around at large radii. Why is there so little in the nucleus? Do you have any, some kind of physical understanding of that? Yeah, um, well, M M31 is a very quiescent source. So it's not really active. And uh, I would expect, that I would expect, perhaps we could have measured a very high inflow rate. It would come from the simulations. But why there is so much dust and it gets so little there, um, is fundamental. Also, you can make the same question for other galaxies. Um, um, I think we have tried to, to, to look a little bit on that. I think that the way of forming uh, nuclear spirals is a way to make friction and, um, um, and uh, uh, how you say, um, making material less flowing fast towards the center and less material get flowing towards the center because it gets spread in the, the surrounding regions. That is one thing. The other thing we found with the simulations is that we put more material to inflow 
we started to form, because we include cooling, we include all the physics, we start to form stars. And because the cooling end up forming, start forming regions. And we don't see that in Andromeda along these filaments, as we don't see in any of the filaments, by the way. So it cannot be there is much uh, material going in these filaments, whatever the reason is at the origin, because it will be more according to our simulations, because we put all the physics, a star formation should appear. And it's not the case. We never see a star formation in the filaments. Definitely not in the filaments of quantum. In knowing the other cases we have seen, the spiral, nuclear spirals. Mm. I don't know why uh, there might be a correlation with, and in fact, I don't, I don't want to claim it. There is a correlation or a dependence with low inflow rate, low activity. Because as I say, the real matter is at a creation level because you had to lose momentum. So you might have plenty of, of material fall, flowing in, but if they don't lose momentum, they will be circularizing around the center forever. And in the source will accrete. So the key thing is how what happened with accretion and what is the mechanism that make the system losing accretion. But you facilitate, of course, things when you uh, go with less matter towards the center, because at the, at the end, this matter has to accumulate in a disk in the center, in the accretion disk, if you want, or the standard part of the accretion disk. I hope I, I it's a it's an interesting question. I really do not know much, but I know that you put more matter in these filaments, more material, you develop star formation. It's not the case. <laughs> Great, thank you. I mean, that's clearly a fundamental question. Um, so just to tell everyone it is one, but um we're gonna keep going, just asking a few more questions. Um, and uh, afterwards, Jeffrey will be hosting uh, Amadena uh, for students. I encourage you to join. Um, so, Peter, do you want to go next? Uh, sure, Amadena, thank you for this presentation and for the, the, the lovely presentation and pictures and so forth. Um, I guess I just wanted to, to ask a little bit more about your last bullet point and whether the, the inflow rates that you measure are they um, large enough to explain the growth of, of supermassive black holes? Or uh, is there an, another mechanism that needs to augment the inflow rates that you're measuring? Or can mm -hmm. you even answer that question at this point? <laughs> well, I say, I, I will say what I said to Anne. One thing is inflow rate, and it's as far we can get. Mm -hmm. We are not tackling accretion. Accretion is a, is a major phenomenon. And for accretion, I need a mechanism for losing angular momentum. So I can have a higher inflow rate if you want, or even lower inflow. Of course, if I have very inflow rate in, uh, in the accretion is very, uh, uh, the loss of angular momentum is very efficient. I could say, okay, I could explain the growth of the black hole, but I could have very high inflow rate and no lose momentum. And so I can say nothing. So no, I can't say much. I only say that an inflow rate decreasing with Eddington ratio help, but that's it, not more. And we need to tackle the major problem, which is the creation. How with this material that accumulated at the center, we see how we can measure how much is going to a disk eventually, the creation disk. How we manage for this to get at the end in the black hole and efficiency as well. How we get in. So the central mm -hmm. issue then is 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 the loss of angular momentum. Yes, that's how, right. how you do that. Loss of angular momentum and efficiency, how much we, well, uh, probably is related, how much it gets into the hole, how much is radiated out. Because part of the matter that we accrete is radiated. That is why we see outflows, etc. cetera, in the jet. <laughs> okay, so part, we need certain material to ignite process in the aggression disk, the jet, the outflows, etc. What is the efficiency? How much we put on that? How much we put for 
putting materials toward the center and how we make this material lose momentum because it, if it does not lose it, there is no way it's not going to get in. Right. If we use our basic physics, of course. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Juan. Hi, um, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, this is the first time I came to this uh, lecture series. I, I'm so glad I discovered it. Uh, so um, I have a lot of questions. Uh, maybe I'll email you um, at a later time about you know the rest of the questions. But first, um, I'll just ask two quick questions. First, um, you said that the filaments are not forming stars. Um, what kind of limit can you put on the star formation efficiency or sort of the depletion time? Like far, how far off are these filaments from you know the normal filaments in the ISM? Um, well, I can say from Andromeda, um, mm -hmm. and still I had to look at the numbers. But I, I know that we had to play because uh, we don't know a priori how much matter is we are going. The, let's put that way: the amount of matter that we inject in one filament and letting fall. Um, uh, driven by the potential of the galaxy and the black hole is something that we choose, okay? Um, so we know that the, for certain value, we start to produce star formation and below a certain value, we can manage to get a nuclear spiral and drive into the central disk that we form. And uh, I will have to look for the number, but it's a little bit... Uh, because we we run from one kilopascal distance, um, I had to look at the number. At this moment, the inflow is ten to minus seven, but we have a, I think about one order of magnitude more, I, I, and I had to check. I had to check. Sorry. Depends also on the distance where you start. This depends also on the characteristic of the medium that you have as well because you have heating, you have thermal expansion, I, you have many processes when this material is falling in, it's interaction with the rest of the interstellar medium in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. So, um, but for the filaments itself, yes, I can give you a number in the particular case of Andromeda. I had to look at the paper, so. Um, I don't and then I have a serious na naive question. Is it, uh, is it possible to, have actual observations for some of these sources and you know estimate the boundary rate or it's it's just too faint to to do it in the actual you the boundary radio you mean if the accretion were boundary well, I mean I, I don't think boundary is operating here but it'd be interesting to see what the the boundary rate would give you um, yes they uh, for m87 this has been done because usually you do that for hot accretion mm -hmm. and you have the hot halos around mm -hmm. and and the problem is that the we have uh, the angular resolutions we, we can set this bonding radius from high energies from x-rays and mm -hmm. then we end up again with angular resolution issues mm -hmm. so for for uh, uh, MET7 was in the several parts of the scales the, the bonding radius Having said that, I think that uh, accretion and many of these galaxies, mm -hmm. in particular the massive ones like M87, have high X ray halos. But the problem with this Bondi radius and Bondi accretion is that mm -hmm. the, the simple fact of seeing the X ray gas is that we are keeping heating up. And so it's not falling down. Mm -hmm. So, um, but well, this is a, a separate issue. Um, mm -hmm. I do not really think much the Bondi applies, I would say. But for example, with M87, if Bondi would apply, we have filaments in H alpha, the very central region of M87, it could be the cooling of X ray halo around. That could be. But um, it has not been treated in that way, I would say. So for the bonding radius, we need better angular, to, to have more precise determination, we need better angular solution, I would say, in the, in the X-rays, because it's where we measure. Okay, thank you so much. Great, very nice questions. And I'm just gonna ask one really quick one, and then we can end, because we've gone over quite a bit, but 
it's it's about the future of the field um, because you mentioned a, a, a very important point that these spatial scales don't get on the accretion level. And there are people here, including you, uh, who are familiar with the VLT gravity results. And as far as I know for NGC 1068 and, and the others that have been looked at that you go down to the dust sublimation radius. Mm -hmm. Is VLT gravity shedding light yes. on potential mm -hmm. inflow on those scales? Well, the, the, you know what happened is, well, the, these observations were mostly tailored to resolve the problem region. What happened with these high angular resolution observations like gravity, in particular gravity, are covering a very small spectral region. It was centered around bracket gamma, and the idea was to see whether we resolve the bracket gamma, uh, the broad bracket gamma resolve the problem region. Um, for, for looking at this uh, filaments and looking at the accretion, you need high angular solution, but uh, also at the same time, a kind of perspective of the region, a kind of field of view of the region. If you are very tiny in the very central region, you miss plenty of information which is in the boundaries as well to connect. And that is what happened when we go with interferometry, extremely high angular resolution, but very detailed in a particular region, lose the boundary, uh, the outer parts. And so it, it has been measured the sublimation radius, the location where the hottest dust could be, but we cannot uh, see this type of filaments. We need angular resolution at that level, but over a larger field of view. That becomes a little bit difficult with interferometry because we are in a very tiny passive scale, really passive or subpassive scale. That's the point. So angular resolution and field of view is quite too contradictory, quite high demanding things. <laughs> Either is one or the other. Yeah, sure, it's challenging. Um, mm. So thanks, thank you so much, Almudena. Let's give her a round of applause uh, for that wonderful talk. And uh, there's a lot more to come in the series. And she mentioned Anil Seth's uh, work and he will be speaking later on um, in the semester. So please join for um, the rest of the talks in the series. And Almudena, uh, I think you, have been given a Zoom link if you uh, would like to talk to our students. That would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Sure. And wishing Thanks. everyone a, a good semester and we will see you soon. Okay, thank you very much for being there. Thank you. Yeah,